this was a million euros, and I'd never seen a million euros in my life. It had to be taken from Benidorm to Marbella, drinking on the way, we are smoking weed all the way down there, we didn't really give a f mate, and we're sitting with a million euros in the back seat. He calls us and said, right, leave it in the boot, and sit in the McDonald's, and wait, and watch. I looked at Jason, I was like, we're fucking dead. These are the people that you're gonna get clipped straight away. Just lost them a million euros. Mate, I've got something to tell you. Someone's taken the money. They picked him up, put it to his forehead, and blew a fucking hole right the way through his head. They then got a scaffold pole, put it through his head, and span him round. What's he gonna do? Is he gonna dismember me? I saw the way it was going. I wanted no part of it. Death to drug traffickers. It was enough weed to have me killed. Like everybody standard had to have a shotgun. When this car slows down, I'm fucking jumping out and I'm, dr I'm running into the jungle. I don't give a fuck, mate. I'll take my chances with the anacondas. But what am I gonna do? I've got a fucking pump action shotgun here and fuck knows what's in there, mate. This is like some mad DMT trip. Boom, the lights go on. I'm like, oh my God. I put it straight to my fucking head and I said, so me and Jay sat there in the McDonald's. We don't know what the fuck to do. What next move to make? The fat Spaniard still ain't ringing. Jason goes, call your dad. I'm like, fuck, I'm gonna have to call my dad. I've got to do something. Got on the phone to my dad. And it's the middle of the night, remember? So he's asleep, he wakes up. I'm like, dad, I've got something to tell you. He's like, what? He was like, someone's taking the money. We go, what do you mean someone's taking the fucking money? A Merc was supposed to get it, but a black Audi picked it up, dad. Have you told the fat Spaniard? Yeah, I've told him. And what did he say? He was pissed because he was the one that was gonna have to pay for this. I ain't got the money to pay that back. This weren't my money. Fuck knows whose money it was. But my old man had a stake in it as well. This was not a good situation whatsoever, man. You gotta think, I was 22. Jason was like 20, just turned 20. So we're fucking shitting ourselves. We don't know what the fuck's gonna happen here. Do you know what? I couldn't wait any longer. I found the fat Spaniard. I got on the phone to him, it's ringing. It's ringing, Jason's looking at me. He's looking scared, mate. I'm fucking scared. It's ringing. He's not picking up. It's not picking up, mate. I put the phone down, I'm like, shit, shit. And then I'm thinking maybe I'm fucking too fucked and I didn't see what I saw. So I thought, right, okay, next move. Go out to the fucking car, open a boot, double check. So I went out there, opened up the boot, and I was like, fuck, and it had gone. It had gone, mate. So me and Jason got back in the car and just sat there and waited for a fucking call from him. Five minutes passes, 10 minutes passes, not a word between us. I was like, Jay, we should have just fucking went with this money. The whole way down there, we were joking about, do you know what? Let's go, to, let's go to Barbados, let's go to Jamaica. Let's just get a one way flight. Let's just go to Morocco and just carry on going down to South Africa. No one will ever find us, mate. You know, we can make this money last. You know, these things we were talking about on the way down there. So, now I'm thinking we might as well have just done that. So out of the blue, we get a call. I pick it up, it's the fat Spaniard. Slick, not a problem, mate. They sent one of their workers in a black Audi. It's all right, little mistake, it's been rectified. Not a problem, mate. Thank you for your help, boys. Drive safe, puts the phone down. I was like, do you know what? Fuck this shit, I'm out, mate. I'm out, I'm getting my 20 grand and I'm walking the fuck away. I ain't looking back, I ain't doing no fucking money. I ain't doing nothing, bruv. I'm fed up with this shit. I very nearly had a heart attack over that. So I start up the car and start venturing back to Benissa another five hours. So by the time we get there, me, you know, the whole way me and Jason are on a come down, it's sobered up like that, you know? And, and I'm like, you know, oh, I ain't doing this no more, Jay. But the thing is, when I went to prison, Jason went that way with them and I went this way, you know, but I'm not going to say anything about his story, that's up to him if he ever wants to talk about it. But he went one way and I went another. So that was enough for me to just want to walk away, do my own thing, keep away from it all. You know, I had 20 grand there to try and make work. I moved out of the area, I moved to a place called Senegras, which was 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes inland from Denia, where I actually got arrested. Funnily enough, and I thought I could move away and people would, you know, they would leave me alone. You know what I mean? I could just do my thing, just drive my motorbike, smoke my weed, fuck my bird, and take fucking drugs, man, and just live life, you know? And that's, that's what I planned on doing. But shit don't always work out like that. I was doing everything by the book. I was signing in every single day, and then it went down to like twice a week, and then it was 
a couple f f times a month and then it got down to once a month, you know, and I was doing this for years. And it got to a point where I already had my passport. So because I was doing everything by the book, I weren't being looked at or monitored, you know. I, was, I weren't a threat. So, so I decided to go back to England and just try and make it work over there and just every month come back and sign my name and just literally go, I used to go on the first flight about five o'clock from Heathrow or Gatwick and I used to roll up there, you know, and at this time I had no money, man, when I was back there, you know, I'd got through the money. So I was sort of doing whatever I could in England, you know, semi half legit, doing silly things really, but just maintaining, man, to, tr to try and get back to Spain every month to sign my name, it was fucking cost me a fortune in the end. So as I say, I used to get, go there on the first flight in the morning, uh, turn up at Alicante Airport, I used to jump on a coach, which took me down to Benidorm, and I used to get someone to pick me up from Benidorm, or I used to jump on a train, which then took me to Benissa, and they get someone to pick me up from Benissa. Then someone would take me down to Denia, I would sign my name, then they would take me straight back, and I'd do the same thing and just go straight back on the next flight. And I was doing that for 10, I was doing that for 10 years straight, you know? So as I say, I had to fund that somehow. In the end, I did have to get a job. So I was semi half legit, doing a bit of weed, you know, and working as a bricklayer on the building site. So I had money coming in. I was working on a, as a labourer, so I weren't like a full-on bricklayer. I was just on a labourer's wage, you know. So, so I didn't have a lot of money coming. And when you when you're in England and you fall into that English mentality again, and you're fucking down the pub three or four times a week, sniffing, drinking, women, it's easy to fall back into that fucked up English mentality, man. And it didn't take me long at all, to be honest with you. So when I went back to England, it weren't long before everybody knew that I was going back to Spain and all that, you know, they all knew my circumstances and shit. And then all of a sudden, you got 10 times more friends than you ever used to have because everybody wants to go to Spain, yeah? Which is fair enough, okay? I don't blame them, yeah? But what they didn't understand these people is that every time I went back to Spain and I had to sign my name in and do all that procedure, I never knew whether I was coming out again every single time. So it was always a risk for me. So every time I went in there, no matter who I took with me, I would take my jewelry off and I would give them my money give them my passport, give them everything that I had, the keys to the car, make sure that they can drive the fucking car right and get back and shit, you know, and I couldn't tell them this until they got there because no one would want to come out with me. And the reason why a lot of them was coming out with me and they wanted to enjoy a holiday, my old man come out of a little plan and he was like, there's some money that needs to be brought from England to Spain. So as I was coming over, do I want to do that and earn a couple of quid? This is what I'm saying, it's just stupid. But I got to a point where I thought money in my suitcase, 10 grand, and all my mates have got 10 grand. It ain't too bad. You know, you could kind of sort of explain that, you know. But, you know, but sometimes we went a bit more. I think the most I ever had in my uh, suitcase coming to Spain was 20. That was the most I would ever do, you know. But it was normally 10 and we used to split it up. So, you know, I used to take my mates out there and fill their suitcase up basically with money and, and take them out there. So I was exploiting them really the same way that my dad was exploiting me. So it's a, just a vicious cycle, isn't it, you know? But I'm proud to say that I'm the one that stopped that, stopped that cycle, deaded that cycle. That cycle no longer exists and I made sure of that. So this one time me and two of my mates, I think one of them was Aki, Steve. We called him Aki, Steve Atfield. And the other one was a geezer called Nick. Now Nick has a whole series that I could dedicate just to this fella because he was the wildest man I've ever met in my life. And I'm talking, this kid was young man. He was like two years older than me at the time. So he was about 24 and this geezer was fucking gangster through and through. Like, I'd never known anything f f like it. And I knew the real killers, mate. And this geezer was way more unpredictable. And, uh, yeah, as I say, there's a whole st series on Nasty Nick, you know? Because um, in the end, he ended up robbing the whole firm. But we'll get to that story. Them boys are coming out with me. It was actually Nasty Nick, I think, who picked us up from the airport. But regardless, I had a couple of mates with me and they had money in their suitcase. And my dad had a partner. Let's just call him Gunman Eddie, 
right? And let me tell you something about Gunman Eddie. He is ex-SBS, so that's higher than SAS, Special Forces. They were hired gunmen. He was in a hired hitman mercenary fucking crew that were hired by the government to go and just kill people. You know, so this fella was serious. You wouldn't have thought it when you looked at him though. Didn't look like that type at all, but they're the ones you have gotta be careful these days in general. So one day he told me this fucked up story just to put you in the mind of this geezer. Him and his SAS buddies was doing a tour of Afghanistan, you know, just killing shit. Hired to kill people. Take out as much Taliban as possible. They got hold of this one Taliban fella. You know those sniper rifles with the big fuck off scopes and you can hit something from over a mile? They picked him up, put it to his forehead and blew a fucking hole right the way through his head, right? And if that ain't fucked up enough, they then got a scaffold pole, put it through his head and span him round. So he's going round and round like that while they're filming it, laughing their heads off. Now that's not a geezer you want to fuck about with, is it? Now, me and him did have a little problem at one stage, but that's a whole other story we'll get into another time. But, you know, he always had a lot of guns. And I'd never seen a gun or even held a gun in my life. So I always wanted to see one or at least hold one or shoot one or something, you know. And, you know, I was a bit wild at that time, a bit stupid myself, you know. But so we got to his house, me and my mates, and he's got a beautiful house, beautiful villa, beautiful bird, loads of money. And he's got guns stashed everywhere. And he had a Smith & Wesson under his pillow and under his bed he had a pump action shotgun. So we're all sat there, we're all just chilling, getting the money out, giving it to him. And I said, Eddie. Let's have a look at your shotgun. And he goes, all right. So Nick is on the camera, he's on it. And it was, do you know what? The, the camera phones hadn't long come out. This is how far we're going back here. And so the camera footage weren't great. It's quite pixelated, but I challenge anybody because that is still on the internet, on YouTube somewhere. I can't remember what the title is. I've tried looking for it. Days and days looking for that shit. Can't find it. If I challenge anybody, I was wearing a, a cream hoodie holding a pump action shotgun. It'll be pretty pixelated, but here's the story because this can vouch for everything. It's all on camera. So I'm holding this big fuck off shotgun. It was so heavy, man. I'm just barely lifting it, holding it like this. Never held anything like this in my life. And Eddie comes along out of the blue and puts the Smith & Wesson down my trousers right next to my dick, yeah? If you don't know what a Smith & Wesson is, it's, you know, the ones with the, the, put loads of bullets in the chamber, like the Western guns, you can spin them and that. He's come along, put it down my trousers, and I thought nothing of it, because I'm holding this pump-action shotgun. So then I look at it like that, I hand over the pump-action shotgun back to Eddie, and I pull out the Smith & Wesson. And I look at it like that, and I don't know this is loaded, right? I'm thinking he's not going to put a loaded gun next to my dick, is he? I put it straight to my fucking head, and I said, What's this, a Smith & Wesson? Bam! Like that, and shot it straight into the wall. And I was fucking, I was like, do you know what? I nearly blew my brain out that day. One slight little move, I would have blown my brain out. And I often think to myself, the scenario, if I did blow my brain out that day, what would have went down? What would have Eddie have done? What would have Eddie have had to have done? The first thing he would have had to have done is dispose of my body without my old man knowing or without anybody knowing. Are my friends going to keep their mouth shut? Or is Eddie going to take them out too? What's he going to do? Is he going to dismember me? Is he going to fucking set me alight? Bury me? What's this cunt going to do? Because he ain't going to let that go out and go to prison, is he? I've just blown my brain out on his fucking kitchen floor. So I often think how Eddie would have handled that. At this time, you know, Eddie, Mold Man, and load of others, you know, they were heavily, heavily involved in the cocaine game. You know, in the end they were caught, it was in the papers, whether this is true or not, but half a billion was made out of their cocaine ring. And as I say, I saw the way it was going. I wanted no part of it. I didn't mind doing a little bit of money here and there. Yeah, but when it comes to, getting my hands dirty with any of that. I'd just done bird. I was on bail as it was. I was even taking bad risks. So I wanted nothing to do with it. And even my brother saw the way it was all going and he fucked off when, and shortly after I got out of prison. He saw what was going on. He didn't want no part of it. And in the end, they all went down, you know? So 
it's, I got out at the right fucking time and so did my brother. So my old man had two other partners. One was a scouser and one was a mank. My old man did have his hands in a lot of pies and one of them was, and I don't know the whole involvement, but I know they tapped into a pipeline, an oil pipeline in Poland. So I was always taking like samples from England and my mates were taking them to Ireland and things. So listen, I don't know what the fuck was going on, but that was just one of the things he had on the go, as well as the cocaine and a government link in Manila for replica cigarettes. Now these replicas were so fucking good. It was all sign written in English. You could not fucking tell unless you smoked one, but they replicated Benson and Edges, all the top brands, Mayfair, any fucking thing you wanted and it was one pound for 200. So can you imagine the profit margins there? So my old man was on it. He's like, right, we're going over to Manila to go and have a meeting with this government fella. Do you want to come for a holiday? And I was like, well, fuck it. If that's all I've got to do, yeah, yeah, I'll come. I could do with a holiday. I hadn't had a holiday since I come out of prison. So I was like, fuck it. Yeah, let's go. Never been that side of the world before in my life. So my dad, his scouse partner, and his mank partner and me, we all went to Manila. We all went out to Singapore. Now I've got a little story that I don't even like telling because I don't even want to bring heat onto it because I'm in Thailand right now and I would never ever fucking do any stupid shit like this. But I ended up taking a little bit of weed with me, right? And when I got to Singapore, sign out this waiver thing and in it, it said death to drug traffickers and I fucking shit myself. It was enough weed to have me killed, you know? And it weren't even a lot of weed, it was like an eighth, maybe a quarter of weed. Stupid, I know, stupid. Young, fucking dumb. So I'd never fucking ever do any stupid shit to ever jeopardize anything like that in my life again. And when I saw death to drug traffickers, I was like, what the fuck am I gonna do here? So I told my dad and he was like, phew, fucking idiot. And you know, the Philippines was a crazy place, man. Like everybody standard had to have a shotgun. So when you're filling up your petrol for your car, mate, he stood there looking at you with a fucking pump action shotgun. You go into any shop, the mate is guarding it with a pump action shotgun. You don't get that in Thailand, you know what I mean? So it was a crazy vibe. Even when you went into the, the Hilton, they've got like a little bomb scanner to go underneath your car. So fuck knows what is going on over there, but it weren't, it was a grimy old place, mate. You know, I didn't like it at all. But we were there for business. So the first night, you know, we've got a lot of crazy stories about Philippines, but I'll just go to this main one. And to cut a long story short, we were sat in the Hilton, us four, and waiting for this government geezer, we call him Nathan. So we're waiting for him. He turns up with three women, three women for all them. And I'm sat there, I'm young, I'm drunk. I'm taking a the piss, they're taking a the piss back. I'm snapping and I'm getting a bit, agitated now they're calling me a kid shut up and just you know because i was just being annoying or whatever the fuck i was doing at the time i can't remember but the them boys wanted to crack on and wanted me out the fucking way it, to cut a long story short but they've never met this nathan before in their life they've only had phone call and email correspondence right so i don't know this fucking geezer who works for the government you know what i mean he saw me getting pissed off with everything he grabbed hold of my arm and he was like come on rick we go and he pulled me up and said, come with me. And I was like, no, I ain't going with you, mate. What the fuck? Looked at my old man, I was like, I ain't going with him. He was like, nah, nah, he's all right, mate. Go with him, go with him. They just wanted me out the fucking way. And then the scouse and the mank piped up. Go on, mate, he's all right, he's a good guy. I was like, do you know what? Fuck you lot then. All right, I'll go with him. You know what I mean? And I'm apprehensive with this fella. I am keep asking him, where are we going? Where are we going? He's like, you were like this, my friend. So I'm like, all right, whatever. Drive 10, 15 minutes out of the city, starting to come to just shacks, just corrugated iron shacks. If you know Philippines, it's corrugated iron shacks. They live in, in the fucking jungle and that. There ain't much else, man. And we're going out further. Now the corrugated iron shacks are disappearing. Now I'm just going into jungle. And I'm like, what the fuck? Where are you taking me, mate? And he's like, don't worry, Rick, you like this. And I was like, what the fuck, man? I do not like this geezer. We're now half an hour away from the city of Manila. And I'm like, I do not trust this cunt. What the fuck is going on? So now I'm asking him again and I'm getting agitated more. And now he's taking a call and he ain't even answering me. I'm like, right, when this car slows down, I'm fucking jumping out and I'm, I'm running into the jungle. I don't give a fuck, mate. I'll take my chances with the anacondas. I ain't getting fucked out here, man. I ain't going out like that. Like the car ain't slowing down, man. So before we know it, we come to this big fuck off warehouse corrugated iron building 
with big walls around it. It kind of looked like a fucking jail. And I'm looking at it as we're going around it. And I'm like, what the fuck is this place, mate? What are, where are you taking me? Don't worry, Rick. Now he's getting a bit agitated back. And I'm like, oh my God, this ain't fucking good. So we rolled up to these big gates. We're in front of these big gates and there's a big minder holding a pump action shotgun again. As a little word with the government geezer, lets us through. I'm like, fuck. Big gravel yard area and just one big fuck off building in the middle with big doors at the front of it. We roll towards it. He starts getting out the car. I'm like, I ain't getting out the fucking car, mate. He goes, Rick, you were like this, my friend. I was like, I ain't getting out the fucking car, but what am I gonna do? I've got a fucking pump action shotgun here and fuck knows what's in there, mate. I had no choice. I got out the car. He's walking towards the door. I'm slowly following him, looking around me, thinking I'm, I ain't going out like that Taken film. You know what I mean? But I don't know, I'm running out of options. I'm just following this geezer on what will be, will fucking be. But as we're walking towards the door, I'm nervous behind him and the door opens and a fucking jester, a jester midget holding a pump action shotgun on my mother's fucking grave opened the fucking doors to us and led us in like it was nothing. You know the jester suit with the bell and the fucking shape colors there? What the fuck is going on here, man? This is like some mad DMT trip. So I'm walking in there and it's pitch black in this big fucking room, brother. You can't see fuck all. I can see some seating area over on the right, but we're following this midget jester. He leads us over there and then walks away into the fucking darkness. He said, take a seat, my friend. So I sit down and prepare my fucking mind for whatever is about to happen, but I can't see nothing. Boom, the lights go on. I'm like, Oh my God. 